So um, Morris will speak for about half an hour, then plenty of opportunity for questions thereafter. Over to Mark. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Gordon. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Well, can I just say how uh, lovely it is to uh, be, here with, be here with you all. Um, I'm not quite sure what you, you want me to cover, so what I'm going to do is kind of give you a splattering of my working life. Um, and I'm going to just talk about a few of the things that I learned when I was at the John Lewis Partnership. I was there for 34 years. Um, and then I want to talk to you about setting up a digital business and what that's been like and uh, what's good about it and perhaps what's more challenging about it, which I hope you'll find uh, interesting. So um, uh, I come from Crewe in Cheshire. Uh, my dad had his own small business. He was a biscuit uh, and sweet wholesaler. So he used to buy uh, biscuits and crisps from the big companies uh, at the time, the McVitie's and the Burton's and the Westerns. And then what he used to do is he used to sell them on to smaller shops. And the reason he did that is the small shops couldn't order in enough volume from the big manufacturers. So he set himself up as a middleman. Uh, before that, he owned a grocer shop. Uh, he did some time in corporate, but he always kind of wanted to work for himself. He always wanted the freedom and the flexibility to work for himself. So I can remember as a kid uh, helping him unload vans, loading up his van, going out with him delivering to all kinds of uh, people. Uh, when the phone rang at night, uh, I pick up the phone, uh, I take orders. Um, I think now there's, a, there's a, a law against that. I think it's called modern slavery and child labour, but it hadn't been invented in the 1960s. Um, when things were going really well, my dad used to take us at the weekend for an ice cream in Landudno, which wasn't too far away. If things were going badly, it was always my mum. My mum used to chase us around the house with a slipper telling us to turn the lights off. So at a really early stage, I worked in business and I got a feel for what does it feel like when things are going well? What does it feel like when things are going badly? Uh, as Gordon very kindly said, uh, I went to university, I read archaeology and ancient history, which I loved, absolutely loved. I spent my summers in Italy digging, uh, spent my winters in the UK digging in cold and not as great places. Uh, but I was also a mad keen golfer uh, and I was either going to be a pro golfer, although you wouldn't believe it from the size of me now, or I was going to be a marine archaeologist. And my dad said, look, get a proper job. 1982, things weren't great in the economy, get a proper job. So uh, I applied for a few. Um, I was offered a job by Marks and Spencers and by the John Lewis Partnership. The reason I chose the John Lewis Partnership is because it had two golf courses and five ocean-going yachts. And then I stayed there for 34 years, a long time. And I want to talk to you a little about the John Lewis Partnership and the, the model, because it's so different to anything else you're likely to come across. And it's that that sort of influenced me to do what I'm doing now. One of the key lessons I learned, though, at the John Lewis Partnership apart from the thing I'm going to talk to you about, was that the most important thing to do is to love the customers you've got. So many people, when they set up their um, new business uh, or their marketing department, their focus is on bringing new people in rather than on loving the people that they've already got and nurturing them. And so when I ran Waitrose, which I did for 10 years, we did things like give our customers free cups of coffee. We gave them newspapers. And everything that we did was about really looking after the ones that we had so that they'd go and tell their friends and families that they should come and shop in Waitrose. So in very simple terms, I learned this model that you nurture and look after the customers you've got. But the other thing I learned was this. How do I... Make the slot. Thank you, Jim. Now, you might think the picture of somebody falling off a horse uh, is not the most inspirational start to a talk on entrepreneurship. But this um, is a picture to remind me that in 1918, at the end of the First World War, Speed and Lewis, who was the son of John Lewis, who opened the John Lewis department store in Oxford Street in, 19, in 1864, had a horse riding accident. And he was so badly injured, he was off work for six months. And while he was off work, 
a number of things struck him. First was that the pay of his dad, his brother and himself was more than all the other people that worked in John Lewis and Peter Jones, the other department store they owned at the time, put together. And he thought that can't be right. It can't be right that we're earning all this money and the people that work for us collectively aren't earning as much. The second thing that he did is he went to visit some of the other workers who were, um, uh, who were sick and he went to their homes and he was pretty appalled by the conditions that they were living in. And again, he thought, this can't be right. We need to do something about this. As you'll know, in 1917, there was a revolution in Russia. And the thought was very much that communism, Marxism would come into the UK. And he kind of thought that the family business might be taken away from them if that happened. So whether you think that he was a great philanthropist or whether you think he was just trying to preserve the family business, what he did was to make a decision that he would give the business to all of the people that worked in it. So all the shares he would put into a trust and everybody in the company would own the company. He wasn't able to do that until 1928, uh, about 10 years later than he had the idea. And the reason that it took that long was that his dad vehemently opposed what he was trying to do. His dad thought he was mad. And it was only when his dad, John Lewis, died in 1927 that he was able to carry through uh, his ambition and he got all of the shares and he turned all the shares of the company over to the workers and he said, collectively now, we all own the company. And it became a partnership. And in the UK, there aren't many. There's about 100, but there aren't very many. And it was a really radical idea. But the... The thing that was even more radical is that he wrote a constitution and his constitution for the business had as its founding principle, the first principle of the business, is that the John Lewis partnership existed solely for the happiness of the people that work there. Which when you think about it is, well it's a bit nuts isn't it? I mean can you imagine setting up a business and you say the only reason I've set up this business is for the happiness of the people that work there. It wasn't for my customers, it wasn't for the shareholders, it was for the people that work in the business. But he had this idea, what he thought was, if I really look after my people, what will happen is that they'll stay with me for longer, I'll be able to train them more, they'll be more committed, they'll be happier. As a consequence of that, my customers will get much better service. If my customers get much better service, they'll be more loyal, they'll stay with me longer. As a consequence of which, I'll make more profit and I'll have a better business that's more sustainable. And if I have a better business that makes more profit, I can give even more back to all the people in the business that are making it stronger. So in 1928, he thought, that this was a really good way to run a business. What's interesting is that more and more people think that that's a good idea. Richard Branson now at Virgin says, it's all about the people first. If you put my people first, we'll have a better business. And I can remember going to my first business schools in the early 90s. And I can remember going to Columbia Business School uh, in New York. Uh, uh, people had flown from all over the world to come to this two-week course on strategy. Uh, there were 48 of us. The lecturer came in uh, on the first evening, which was Sunday evening, wrote on the chalkboard, what is the supreme purpose of a chief executive? And hands all around the room went up. And what people said was, maximise shareholder value. The sole job of the chief executive is to make money for the shareholders. And I sat there and I thought, well, that's not the company I work in. So right at the end, uh, I put my hand up and I said, actually, I work in a company where the sole purpose is the happiness of the people that work there. And I have to say, I wrecked the course for two weeks because at every turn, what happened is that people were arguing in a kind of a chicken and egg way, which comes first, the happiness of the people and then profit, or do you prioritise profit and if you can, look after your people? 
since then, lots of academic research has been done. And I wrote a book, came out uh, three years ago now, 2016, called Fairness for All, which talks about the John Lewis model. But it also talked about lots of academic evidence from uh, universities and academic institutions all over the world. And what it says is if you have a happy and engaged workforce, your profits are 20% higher, your productivity is 20% higher, your wastage is 43% lower, your staff turnover is lower, your sick absence is lower, and your earnings per share are 134% higher. So whether um, it's just correlated to good performance or not, all the statistics say that if you work in a company that values the individual, that thinks about their happiness, that helps them to be engaged, that company performs better. It's irrefutable. Occasionally, when I talk, um, some people say to me, that's complete bunk, and we don't believe that at all. There is no difference in performance between having a happy and engaged team and a miserable team who you flog to death. And when they say that, my answer is this. What would you rather have? Would you rather go into work every day and create an atmosphere where people are really unhappy and miserable, or do you want to go into work every day and create an atmosphere where people feel engaged and happy and well looked after? So I think there's a moral as well as a financial reason that organisations should be thinking about the happiness of their people. So if you start thinking about that supreme purpose is happiness and happiness drives commercial performance, the next question you ask yourself is, how do you measure that? You'll all know from your, uh, from your studies that you know, companies look at their profit and loss account, they look at their sales, they look at their costs, they look at their balance sheet, they look at their assets, all those financial measures. But I would challenge companies to say, but are you looking and measuring the happiness of the people that work in your company? Because for me, that's a leading indicator of whether you're going to do well, whether people are going to stay, whether you're going to be able to train people. So during my time at the John Lewis Partnership, what I started to understand is, what is it that makes people happy at work? And I'm just doing a piece of work now with Lancaster University on a student's happiness survey. So what is it that makes students happy when the time they're studying? But this one is about what makes people happy at work. So in the book, I set out the six things. Yeah, sorry, Jill, I'm giving you a lot of exercise. Um, and there are six things. The first thing that I want to say is if I say to you, it's all about happiness at work, I suspect a lot of you think that's kind of like a, a happy, clappy, hippie thing. It's not tangible, it's not measurable. Um, and very few places in the world have happiness as an objective. The American Constitution talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. King of Bhutan wants happiness for his, uh, his subjects. Um, uh, in the Middle East, more recently, Qatar started to measure the national happiness uh, of Qatar, but it, it's not a well thought through concept. But I think that it is really tangible. I think it is measurable. I don't think it's that thing where you walk in and you say, you know what, I felt happy at, at, at my academic studies today. I felt unhappy. I feel happy at work. I feel unhappy at work. It can be measured. And there are six things that I just want to go through with you which are the, the tangible elements of whether people are either happy or unhappy at work. The first is reward and recognition. Um, pay is the first. Pay doesn't make you happy. Gordon's choking on that. That's because he's big crap. Yeah. So let me explain why. If um, Hertzberger, uh, if you want to reference him, said that um, pays a hygiene factor, if you are paid 5% less than you think you are worth, then it's an issue for you. It niggles away. You think this lot are getting me on the cheap. I'm worth more than this. But if you are paid 5% more than you think you're worth, 
you do not skip into work every day saying, yippee, they're paying me 5% more than I think I should get. And in the research that I do, pay is the ninth most important thing when people really think about their workplace happiness. So you've got to get pay right, but pay in and of itself does not create happiness at work. It minimises discontent. That's the best you can do with pay. The thing that really makes a difference is recognition. Whether you tell somebody they're doing a good job or not, or whether you're giving them feedback. In the UK, on average, people are thanked for doing something well at work once every four and a half months. Three times a year, it's likely that somebody will say to you, that was really good, thank you very much. Or find a way of recognising it. However, people are criticised twice a week. So what we're really good at is criticising. You didn't do that well enough. You could have worked harder. All of that we do. And the thing about criticism, it does not work. Criticism does not work. And the reason the criticism does not work is this. I say to you, you didn't do that very well. You say to me, you didn't explain to me properly how to do it. You didn't give me the resource to do it. You didn't give me the time to do it. Um, I wasn't properly trained to be able to do this. And so what you do when you're criticised, whether it's on the sports field or whether it's academically or whether it's at work, the first thing your brain does is think of the top three reasons why they're wrong and you shouldn't be criticised. Criticism doesn't work. The only thing that works is praise. You did that really well. You did that really well. If you changed and did this in this way, you could do it even better. That's how you deliver constructive criticism. So over my time at the John Lewis Partnership, what I discovered is you've got to pay people fairly, you've got to reward them for all their energy and their effort, but far more important is recognising people when they do something well. The second is information. Speed and Lewis said the single most important thing in the John Lewis Partnership is information. That people have got the information to do their job, but also they understand the wider context of what's going on. They understand how the company's doing on a wider scale, because only then can people feel empowered to do something? The third is empowerment. And by empowerment, what I mean is giving people responsibility for doing something, allowing them the freedom to do it, respect them and trust them to do a job, and then praise and recognise them when they do it. And to illustrate that point, I just want to tell you a really short story. I live in Sturminster Newson in North Dorset. And about... I don't know if you'll remember this, about eight years ago, there was a delivery company called City, uh, City Link. And City Link went spectacularly bust about two weeks before Christmas. And they were on the news because millions of Christmas presents were sitting in their warehouse that weren't going to be delivered. And people got really angry about it. But the administrator wouldn't let people go in. They couldn't be delivered. And there was a guy who worked in uh, my town who worked for CityLink and I'd got to know him and I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to be a delivery driver. He said, all I've ever been is a delivery driver. I know it, so I'm going to set myself up as a local delivery driver. So I wished him well and I saw him about three months later and I said, how's it going? He said, it's fantastic. I said, what, different to working for CityLink? So different. So I said, well, tell me why. He said, well, when I worked for CityLink, they gave me a van. When the van had done 100,000 miles, they changed the van. He said, if I smashed or crashed the van, they just gave me another one. He said, um, I didn't check the oil, I didn't check the water, I didn't wash it, I washed it on a Friday, I didn't care. He said, now I've bought my own van with my own money. He said, I wash it every night, so when I turn up at a customer's home, it looks really good. I check the oil, the tyre, the water every week because I can't afford not to have my van on the road. I drive it with great care because I know if I drive my van carefully, I'll get 200,000 miles out of it, not 100,000 miles, and I'll make more money. He said, when I worked for CityLink, they gave me two polo shirts to last me the entire year. He said, they were disgusting by Easter. He said, now I wear a shirt and a tie so that when I turn up on somebody's doorstep, I look good. He said, when I worked for CityLink, I was effectively tagged. They tracked me on GPS. I had 70 deliveries to do a day. If I was going too slow, they'd send me a text saying, you need to speed up. He said, I had about 30 seconds at every house to make a parcel drop. 
He said, so if somebody didn't answer the door, he said, I'd either leave the parcel or I'd chuck it over the wall because we couldn't afford to go back again. He said, now, if somebody phones me at nine o'clock because they want a delivery the next day, not only will I answer the phone, I'll get up at six o'clock the next morning to go and deliver it. And that's the difference between owning something and really caring about it and working for somebody else who doesn't care. And so the great secret, if there is one, of the John Lewis partnership of John Lewis and Waitrose is the people there believe that they own the company. 85,000 people believe they own the company and they have a stake. So in any business, what any great entrepreneur will try to do is to make the people that work for them equally feel that sense of ownership and that sense of responsibility. And not just the board members who might be getting big bonuses, but everybody, right down the organisation. And that's what Branson does brilliantly, but a whole host of other people. So empowerment, making people feel responsible, helping people to care for what they do is key. Well-being is the fourth. My favourite all-time quote is um, Theodore Roosevelt, who said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. If you're going to work in an organisation where people really care for your mental, physical and financial well-being, you will be happier and more engaged. The, third, the fifth is having a sense of purpose. You may have all heard that story of the cleaner at NASA when they were being lined up to meet President Kennedy before the, the rocket went to the moon. Uh, Kennedy went along the line and he said to the cleaner, what do you do? And the cleaner said, uh, I'm putting a man on the moon. And it was that sense of pride that he was doing something that was much more than just a cleaning role. What he was doing was helping the whole, whole organisation achieve something that had never been achieved before. And great companies and great entrepreneurs and great leaders make people feel that they are doing something genuinely that has a sense of purpose and is bigger. And then the last is job satisfaction. There are two key things that drive job satisfaction in the workplace. Um, the first is that you are being developed as individuals, that the company genuinely cares for your development and your learning and your growing. And the second is that you have a good relationship with your line manager. 83% of people leave a business because they do not have a good relationship with their line manager. So those things are key in whether a business will grow and succeed. So if you're a manager and you're setting up a business, my premise would be you need to think about pay and it being fair, but you think, need to think far more about uh, how you recognise. You need to think about sharing as much information as you can. You need to think about empowerment. You need to think about well-being, sense of pride and job satisfaction. So, after I'd finished my time in John Lewis and Waitrose, uh, as Gordon said, I went into the government. I was the trade minister for the UK. Travelled the world, um, stepped down from that two years ago, and having written that book, I thought, how am I going to help people understand if they're happy in work? Not just going home and saying, you know what, I had a really bad day, but really, really understand against those six criteria. So, because I thought there was a gap in the market, because I didn't think very much of LinkedIn, because at the time uh, my daughter Holly was 21 and just leaving university, I thought, you know what, I don't think there's anything helping your generation A, get into work, and B, when they're in work, really understand if they're happy, how they can be happier, get the help and support that they need. And at the same time, I thought, I want to help organisations manage uh, and record and track workplace happiness. So I built um, Engaging Work and our uh, works, and our mission is to make the world a little bit happier and a bit more decent. And we've now, um, we now have got 360 companies signed up, we've got 50 companies who've taken the survey, we've had tens of thousands of individuals in 120 companies take the, um, the workplace survey uh, to try and help them be happier. And I'm just going to see if I can put the site up to show you and then I'll stop and take any questions that you've got. So, 
So this is the web. I'm going to ask you to do some clicking, Jill. <laughs> so uh, if you go to the site, there's the site for business, which we won't click on, which is top right. But this is the site that's open to anybody in the world. And if you're in work, you can go to the survey. It's a free survey. And what this is telling you is that today, uh, the average score is 647 out of 1,000. And then it tells you by sector. So if you click on the aerospace and defence, drop down, Jill, uh, down here. So what that will show you is all the sectors. So if you go for not-for-profit, that's it. Okay. So it tells you the score for not-for-profit. So if you work in a not-for-profit organisation, you're actually happier than the average of all the scores that are there. So it'll tell you for sector. And then if you go down to countries, if you click on United Kingdom, we're slightly above the average. Uh, go up, go, where should we go? Go down one to the USA. If you go, keep going down. There you go, United States. United States are much happier, seven, 709. So what I've now done is to build a database which can track by country, by industry. Uh, I'm not going to do the survey with you, but through the survey, by individual, how happy you are. And what it does is it shows you, compared to people that look like you, your age, your gender, your ethnicity, uh, your management level, your job role, uh, where you work, it tells you whether or not you're happy, and then what we help you do is to be happier. If you click on uh, jobs, uh, find work right at the end. Right yeah. So what I've done on jobs is that what we do, can you co go down a little on, uh, sorry, in the middle on live job post. Yeah. So what we do here is all that information we get on how people, happy people are, we then put that on jobs. So there's a job here, John Lewis, retail assistant, but happiest industry rating. What it will do is it will say, this industry is ranked 27th for happiness. And then if you click on the filters, which I won't do, you can say, I'm a woman, I'm under 30. Um, uh, how, what are the happiest jobs and companies for me to work in? So what I'm trying to do is to help people get a picture of where they're gonna be uh, happiness. You go back, Jill to the home page. So if you click on career developer, which is the second one. So on, and this is all free of charge, or it's going to make you sign in. What a pain. Never mind, we won't do that. Go back. So if you go to career developer, there's a whole host of tests. There's a career path test, there's a free CV writer, um, there's EQ test, IQ test, there's an MBTI uh, personality profile test. So you can go and do a free personality profile. And all of those things help people find which jobs they're going to be happiest in. Then we've got a global hub. Uh, I think that's going to do the same. It's going to ask you to sign in. Ah, oh, no. So on the global, global hub, what we have, if you click on podcasts, uh, go up to the top, yeah. So uh, we have podcasts on it. We've got articles. If you go up again and click on lectures, if you go down... So we have um, people posting lectures on here, etc. So it acts as a resource. Uh, if you go back again, Jill, if you click on business library, see the fifth one along? So there's a messenger, uh, which is obvious. And then uh, we sell 80,000 business books on the site. Uh, and in addition to that, we have all the other sections. So what I'm trying to do is to build a site that helps people be happier, healthier, and more successful at work. So why, why did I do that? Why, after, why didn't I go and become the chairman of BP? Um, A, because I felt really strongly that society and individuals will benefit if they can measure, track, and improve their workplace happiness. So for me, there was a great sense of purpose in wanting to do that. Secondly, I saw a massive niche in the market, companies that weren't offering uh, this kind of thing to their employees and companies that weren't tracking and measuring and looking to improve the happiness of the people that, uh, that work there. It, in terms of what I would describe as the two best tracks to be successful as an entrepreneur you either need to think of a product that nobody's thought of yet and find the funding to develop it, 
and the team who are going to support you building it. Or you need to look at a market that looks um, moribund, where things haven't happened for a long time. If you look at, I don't know, my old world um, peanut butter. Nobody done anything with peanut butter for a year. You've got one, two varieties. And then all of a sudden now you get lots of varieties. Look at popcorn. Popcorn was dull, there was sunkissed, and that was it. Now there are about a million popcorn varieties. If you look at fever tree, uh, there was Schweppes and really nothing else. And somebody said, there's got to be a better way of doing this. So they came and they did fever tree. So the best way, the, the way in which most people succeed in terms of a new idea is actually not a new idea. It's taking a category or an area of business that's stale and old and completely reinventing it. Um, if you look at cinemas now, you won't remember cinemas in the 70s and 80s, um, but they were terrible places. And then Blockbuster and Streaming and Sky really stopped the, the cinemas uh, being operationally effective. But now somebody came back and said, look, we can redesign what a cinema is. We can make it an occasion to go out. So those tend to be the two best options. It's either thinking of something that, uh, like I have, you look at LinkedIn and you say LinkedIn isn't doing this, it's connecting, but it's not helping people develop their careers. Nobody else is trying to do this. Therefore, I think there's an opportunity in a market to do it. Or you're sitting down and coming up with a brainwave for something that's never been thought of before, which I have to tell you is an awful lot harder. And it's a lot harder to convince investors. Uh, the, the hardest thing about setting up, uh, there are two, I would say. One is about having the conviction and the belief and the determination to just keep going. I've been building this for two and a half years. And we finish our build uh, probably by Christmas, beginning of next year. So over two and a half years of my life, uh, I've been building this. Um, I haven't been paid. I don't pay myself. All the money I have goes into building it. So you have to think about finance. Uh, and you have to think about um, how you're going to manage finance, which is, I, you could argue, is the number one issue. Number two issue is having the perseverance and belief to keep doing something because you think it's the right thing to do. I'm going to stop there. I've probably talked for over half an hour. Um, what would you like to ask? What do you want to know? So I've built this now, I'm going out for funding round one at the moment. Um, so what I've built has been valued. Uh, so I've got two people who both worked in finance who've come in and they want to be part of it, so they're taking care of the funding round. Um, but yeah, lo loads. Um, I mean, I've always worried. I mean, I've always kind of worried about stuff and I kind of worry because I like to think about what all the problems could be and how would I solve them. So I tend to sit in an armchair and think for an hour about, everybody thinks I'm sort of brain dead, but I'm actually thinking about if this happens and that happens, what would I do, how would I cope with it? So I'm constantly thinking about what I'm going to do, what I want to build. Um, at night now, you know, I'll, I'll be awake for hours at night just thinking about what I'm going to do. I mean, being an entrepreneur is really difficult. If you've got a partner, it's much easier. If two of you can share it. So Candy Kittens, um, the sweet company with Ed Williams and Jamie Lang, um, I interviewed them for a podcast that's on here. And they were talking about sending up, setting up Candy Kittens and how it was going to be different. But they say in the interview, if it wasn't for having each other, they would never have run the course. Um, it's their tough yards. To do it on your own is the most difficult. To do it with a one partner or two partners is infinitely better to share the burden and the problems. But your problems, um, the two main problems that you, you will have are people. 80% of doing any job is people. Getting the best from your people, making sure your people are happy, keeping them on board. About 15% is uh, implementation, so actually implementing things really well, and 5% is the strategy, 
a lot of people over focus on strategy I mean most ideas are pretty straightforward but it's the people bit that's really hard and then implementing to a really high standard so you, you worry about all of those things. Have I got the right people? Are the people doing what they need to do? Are they well enough supported? Then you think about, are we doing this well enough? Does it work? Um, and then after that, you're constantly thinking about the money. You know, because money's fi um, finite. It's not infinite. If you've got, I don't know, £100,000, you have to think, where am I going to put the £100,000? Am I going to put it into building the site or part of the site? Am I going to put it into people who are going to help sell the products that we've got? Am I going to put it into marketing? If I put it into marketing, what return am I going to get? When am I going to get it? What sales am I going to get? So you're constantly challenging yourself about, have I got all of this right? Have I got the balances right? So um, I would say most entrepreneurs that I know have got bags of nervous energy, are by and large worriers and are constantly thinking about how do I drive it forward, where do I go next. So that's a great question, Jill. So the first thing to say is whatever you do, it's not right first time. If you get a home run first time, you've been incredibly lucky. So you have to have enough time, patience and money to refine your ideas and change your operating model. So the, this site has looked different over the course of two years as we found out what works and what doesn't work. The original idea was just to build a survey to help anybody in the world free of charge understand how happy they were at work and improve it. But as soon as I did that, people started to say, but I'm not happy with my job, where should I go to work? So then we said, okay, fine, well, let's add jobs in. And then if we're going to add jobs in, surely what we want to do is link it to the survey so we can tell people the happiest jobs for them. And we did that and then people said, well, I need to ask advice. So we've got free mentor matching. So if you look down there, if any of you go into work and you want a mentor, if you go here, you're matched free of charge with a mentor, somebody who's been in your business and can give you advice. So we built that and we've now got, I think, 600 people being mentored on the site. Um, and then after that, people started to say, I want to ask for expert advice, so if we'd have clicked on Global Hub, there's something that's called Ask an Expert, so you can go on and say, I'm thinking of building a business, I need money, can somebody give me some advice? So what we started to do from that early thought, it sort of grew out because that's what people said they wanted. And then we got into the business library, which we only opened a month ago, where people said, I want information, I want podcasts, I want lectures, I want to know about whatever so how did I build a library that anybody could go to um, and it's a repository for people to put their stuff in so uh, Trinity uh, College in Dublin and Queen's University in Belfast are both going to put their um, MBA student dissertations in the business library so that they sit there so if their students have done a piece of work on the car industry it will be there for people to read in the future and to access. So it grew from a simple idea into being ever more complex. And we did the same for businesses. So for businesses, we started measuring uh, the happiness of their workers and helping them improve it. Then we started to help them recruit through the job site. And then through the messenger, we helped them build a white label messenger which is now used in the Commonwealth, 53 countries in the Commonwealth use our messenger. Uh, Alpha Group, a big group in the Middle East, uh, use our messenger as a white label for communication. So it grew. Just, just one more question. Does the business side of this, are you, are you using that as a, as a money generator to support the business? Or are you using that as a money generator? Yeah. So we, we've got 15 consultants around the country who go and help companies with training uh, to help their managers have a more engaging leadership style. Um, and the other bits are forward for me to do this free of charge to individuals. And there's no advertising. We don't advertise. We don't sell data. Um, and it's all because we do the business side and that affords me the opportunity to give all of this free to individuals.
I think there are only two, well, there's only really one reason why a business fails, it runs out of cash. So if you run out of money, that's it. You know, you've got to shut the doors. So any responsible business owner is constantly thinking about, have I got enough money? So in my business at the moment, I've got enough money to trade for four months if I didn't make a sale. So I can go four months now without making a sale and we're okay. If in the fifth month I don't get any sales, we're out of business. Unless I can find a way of getting more money from somewhere. So um, the minute you start being an entrepreneur, the first thing you worry about is your cash flow, having the money to keep going. The second thing you worry about is um, your people and operational delivery. You know, are, are we moving as fast as we should be? Are the people delivering in the way that they should be? But um, I guarantee you, if you start as an entrepreneur, the very first thing you'll think about is money. The other thing that, that people do is that they say, I'm going to build a, you know, a website. This, I mean, this has cost a huge amount of money to build. But they'll say, you know, I'm going to build something, £50,000, and they build it. But you need five, six, ten times that for marketing to get people to actually come and use your app and download your app or to go to your website. And so what people forget is they think solely about, I'm going to develop the best app to find parking spaces in Twickenham. And it's a great idea. And they say to their friends and family, it's going to cost us 40,000 to build this app. Can we get 40,000? They get the 40,000 and then it just sits there. So the work that Gordon's done all his life around marketing becomes vital. How are you going to get that out there? And what budget do you need to do that? So a lot of people don't think about, they just think about getting it open. They don't think about what do you need for it to grow and to be sustainable. So where most people start is friends and family. So uh, the group of people that are closest to you, you know. Uh, so most people get money from their parents or they'll get money from their aunts or uncles or they go friends and families. After friends and families, you tend to go to, I mean, if you forget the, the crowdfunding, then you go to what's described as high net worth individuals. So I was very lucky that over my years, I just got to know a lot of people who um, were pretty wealthy and so uh, I had a conversation with a couple of them I said that I was going to scale up and they said that they'd be interested in investing in the business and helping to grow it and they know people when you get to a point where you've got a proven business at scale then you can start going to private equity or venture capitalists who will give you a lot more money. So if you're looking for thousands, typically friends and family, maybe crowdfunding, but friends and family, when you're looking for a few million, you're going to high net worth individuals. When you start looking for 20 million, really, then you start going to venture capitalists and um, private equity. Um, you might get something from the bank, uh, but the banks aren't great at supporting people with a good idea who are young and want to start off, unless they've got some sort of asset they can get security of. So if you've got a, I don't know, if you own a house, uh, which is highly unlikely, but if you own a house then you know, they'll take a charge over your house, house and give you a loan. Um, but it's hard. It's the hardest thing. There are some, loads of people with brilliant ideas, um, but most people only want to back ideas that they can see are already working and they know they're going to make money on. Um, so there isn't that much punt money out there. It's why a lot of people are um, building businesses sort of on the side, they've got their day job, and then at night they're, you know, looking to build their business. I mean, loads of people are doing that. And they get to the point where, you know, they can demonstrate it's profitable and there'll be returns, and then it tends to be easier for them to get some money. Well, 
Well, I, I wouldn't advocate becoming friends with your workers. I mean, I, I, I mean, all those six things I talked about, none of them are about personal friendship. And I think that's hugely dangerous. I think that as a manager, you have to be objective. Um, and I think that you can be convivial. I think that you can uh, be kind and sympathetic. Uh, but you can't be a friend. You know, the, the, um, the cricket captain who keeps on a bowler who's being knocked for six on every ball because he's his friend is not a good captain. You know, he's letting down the whole side because he's not accepting his responsibility to deal with the individual. So there's nothing I've said that's about being anything other than um, thoughtful. So paying somebody fairly isn't about being a friend. Telling somebody they've been a good job isn't being a friend. Giving somebody information about the, uh, how the company's doing isn't being a friend. Giving somebody the, phrase, the, the, the um, space to perform isn't being a friend. Caring about individuals' well-being sense of purpose. None of that is about friendship. That's all about being a very competent leader, a manager, and getting the best from your people. I would see it more like a, maybe a journey. So especially when you give someone, someone respect and responsibilities inside, he will come closer to you. Uh, well, so at the beginning stage, as you said, you're not a friend. Yeah. It might be a step towards to get into a closer relationship. Yeah, I, I would think if you're a if you're a good leader, you have followers. So you know, if you're a if you're a good prime minister, there are people that follow you because you're a good leader. It doesn't mean that you're a friend with your cabinet members. So I think that people want to be treated with respect and be trusted. So I I never aspire to be liked by my people, but I always hoped that they would respect me. I always hoped that they thought that I had their best interest at heart. I always hoped that they would think that I was impartial, um, that I was thoughtful, that I was kind. But um, it was never a friendship. We'd never go to the football together other than on a you know, group night out when we went to watch Reading play when I was running Waitrose. So I, I, I definitely don't... I would never say that what I'm advocating is that you have a close friendship. What I would say is that you treat people with respect and trust and you build respect in that way. I think there's, I, th I think there are two things. One would be a marketing thing and the other would be a structural organisation thing. So if you think about supermarkets, um, supermarkets came along in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And before that, you used to walk along the high street and you go to the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, um, and uh, you would buy from lots of different people. Then the supermarket came along and it gave you the convenience of buying all those things under one roof more efficiently. The way that the internet has started, and apps in particular, because of the immaturity of the sector, is that people think you need to have an app for all these millions of things. So if you all look at your phones, you've got hundreds and hundreds of apps. And so that proliferation has come from both marketing thinking that you have to specialise, you have to be very clear. Um, and also just from the fact that doing what I'm trying to do is very difficult. Um, so my view is that if you can find a space that people can go to and they say, I can manage my whole working life from here. I've got a messenger, I've got email, I've got video and conference calling on the app, I've got this, I've got that. They'll just say, you know what, this is just a great home to be. I can get everything I need. Um, that's the first thing. So it's trying to take a different view of the proliferation that you have today. If you were going to have apps for all of this, You'd have a job app. I don't know if there even is a career developer app. There's messengers. Um, Global Hub, you might have, I don't know, Facebook or LinkedIn in terms of their street business library. Um, you might look for business books on Amazon. You might find another site to do. But nobody tries to pull it all together. 
but you're right because the communication risk is you're trying to explain something to somebody that they've never seen before. So you're saying, I'm trying to build a site that's about helping people have healthier, happier, more successful careers. And they're thinking, well, what can that be? How does, how does that work? The second thing is, it's who you market to. So I, th I think, it'd be interesting to hear your reaction. I think LinkedIn now is really stale. I think it was built 15 years ago um, for a group of people that wanted to connect and then jobs have sort of been bolted on. And I don't think it's relevant to a new generation. I think a new generation coming into the workplace who are 21, 22, don't necessarily think LinkedIn is where I need to be. It looks old, it looks stale. And all the research we've said is that it will be very hard to convert 40 year olds from LinkedIn to this platform but actually, it will be very easy to get uh, people leaving university, millennials. So we work at the moment with six universities, um, with their students, helping them uh, find the right jobs, et cetera, and build their careers. So it's really thinking about, rather than segmenting the product, it's segmenting the market to say, which group of people are going to need a tool to help them in work, get into work and get through work, and who's doing that, and how's ours going to be different? No, the, the unique thing that we do with our survey is that there are lots of companies that do staff surveys, but none of them give individuals feedback when they've done the survey. Uh, none of them give in results instantaneously, and they all cost a fortune. Ours cost very little. So we've got an absolute USP in terms of our business offering. Nobody's designed anything that tries to do all the things I'm doing on here. What you see is... Um, Facebook trying to be more business, so they do workspace, so they're now trying to say, we know that this site isn't great for people at work, so how do we build it out a bit? Um, WhatsApp is used a lot for business, but it's not really a business site, and interestingly, they're going to put advertising on it next year, and I think that if you are using it for a business group, you're going to start saying, does this feel right? Um, if you look at LinkedIn, they've tried to add more elements but people are still using it for connection. So I think lots of sites have said, well, how could we grow a bit? Rather than somebody right at the start saying, I'm going to build a site that's to help people get the most they can from their working life. So in a sense, I think it's very hard for them to backtrack from the position that they've built over 15 and 20 years to say, actually, we're going to become more like this. The truth is, I could be wrong. I could, you know, I could be wrong. In two years' time... Um, I might have shut up the shop, I might have lost a lot of money, it might have been a great idea, but it just didn't work. Um, that's what you don't know as an entrepreneur. I think, uh, so I'll answer your, your question uh, in two ways. Uh, first I'll talk about faith and then I'll talk about uh, philosophy, and I'll start with philosophy, and then I'll talk about faith. So, if you go back, the first people to ever write about happiness as a concept or ego uh, in its wider sense as a concept uh, was Socrates uh, about 3,000 years ago now. And what Socrates said is that there are two forms of happiness there's happiness that comes through doing the right thing, uh, from helping people from good deeds, good acts. And there's happiness that comes from achieving things, buying a new car, though they didn't have cars in ancient Greece, or buying a house, or winning a race, or being successful, or being promoted. What he said is that the second of those, it's temporary. You know, you'll buy something new for yourself, I don't know, a new piece of clothing, you'll think this is fantastic, you feel good. But the next day, you won't. That feeling leaves you. Whereas if you help somebody, what will happen is you will think about it for a long time. If you just sit there now and think about when did I help somebody and how good did that make me feel? So Socrates recognised that there's two forms of happiness. Aristotle, 100 years later, said 
every action of every human being is predicated on their personal happiness. Everything that you do. Even when you're trying to make somebody unhappy, it's because you think it's going to make you happy. Being mean to somebody is about you feeling better because you've made somebody else feel bad. So everything that we do, every act, according to Aristotle, was based on our drive for personal happiness. So whether you're at home or whether you're in work, everything you do, or whether you're in class, everything you do is about what's going to make you happy. The second thing that I would say in terms of faith, my dad was a preacher. He used to preach on a Sunday and drummed into me from the earliest age was um, everybody's equal. Nobody's better than anybody else. In the eyes of God, uh, everybody's the same. We've just all got different talents and different abilities and different skills. And our job is to help people draw out those skills and abilities. And you should always act with kindness and empathy and sympathy for others. That's just the very simple values that I was brought up with. And so I suppose that this is about helping people make the best of themselves, whatever it should happen, that should happen to be. I think that um, helping people understand that um, you don't have to settle for being treated badly at work. That is not acceptable. You know, people use that phrase work-life balance. That implies that you do work and then you have a life. You're going to work for 13 years of your life. That's how long you're going to spend at work. You've got to enjoy it. At the very least, if you're not enjoying it, you can do a test and you can work out why am I not enjoying it. I did this yesterday. I did a, I do a podcast and I, I did it with Bruce Daisley, who's the VP of Twitter, and I've done it with Martha Lane Fox and uh, Jamie Lang, a whole host of people. And I did it yesterday with a guy called John O'Brien, um, who's big on helping organisations with a sense of purpose. And he's really happy. He works for Omnicom, he built a business, he sold a business, he's really happy. We did the test and there was one area where he scored poorly and it was information. And he didn't think that the company he now worked for were giving him the information that he needed to do his job uh, and he didn't feel that Omnicom, this huge global business, was sharing with him what was going on. And we finished it and he said, you know what, Mark, something was really niggling me. I knew I wasn't totally happy with everything, but I hadn't worked out what it was. And I've now done this and now I'm going to go away and I'm going to have these conversations. So my view of the world is if I can help people identify what it is about their job. You know, if you're not being paid enough, we, we show you uh, lectures or we give you podcasts to go and listen to that says, look, this is the kind of conversation you might want with your boss about how you get more pay. Or if you don't feel that you're being trusted, here's a conversation that you should have about how you get more trust and responsibility in work. So for me, doing that uh, fills my social purpose. I hadn't really thought that it came from that background, but I'm sure it's so deep within my DNA, it's what it does drive me. I had two books published this autumn, one called Six Steps to Engaging Employees, the other called Six Steps to Happy Customers, and I've got one coming out next year called Six Steps to Engaging Leadership. And what it's about is it's helping managers understand, to, to your question earlier, um, what they need to do to be an engaging leader, to get people to follow them, to want to follow them. So I think it's really important. What I can tell you from the survey, I mean we've done so many, we've got so much survey data now. Um, so for, for your cohort going into the workplace, what I can tell you is that women are slightly happier than men. Um, I rather sadly have to tell you that people in non-management roles are happier than people in management roles. And the reason for that I think is that middle management in business has been hollowed out and so people going in now are promoted quite quickly to management jobs but aren't being given the, the guidance, the support, the mentoring, which is why I set up mentoring here, so that people can get it. Um, 
your generation tend to have a, a much um, uh, greater focus on organisations with a sense of purpose. Uh, if you don't get that, you, you move quite quickly. You think it's, as a, I'm generalising madly, but you think it's more important. Your biggest gripe as a group when you get into work is you're not being developed. You've started in a company, you've got your degree, you've worked very hard, you go and work somewhere and you're dumped in an office or something and people are not giving you... <laughs> people are not giving you the development that you need. So there are lots of issues that are affecting your cohort coming into work which are very different than an older cohort. If you look at another, another group which aren't happy are, are men uh, in their 45s and the reason they're not happy is they see the world of work changing, more technology coming in, they don't feel that they're being equipped for that, they feel very insecure because they're losing their jobs but they've got mortgages to pay and they you know, believe that they need to work for another 20 years but they don't get the support they need. So what my survey starts to draw out is how happy all those groups are and then what they might need to improve going forward. So it's different for every group, it's different for every individual. So to a large extent it's trial and error. Pricing is really difficult. Uh, if you're running a supermarket and you want to sell Heinz baked beans, the first thing you go and do is look and see what price everybody else is selling Heinz baked beans on. If you want to sell more than everybody else, you drop your price. If you want to sell fewer but make more margin, you stick your price up. But over you know, decades, supermarkets build pricing models. On something like this that's brand new, you have to look at LinkedIn and you say, well, what does LinkedIn charge a recruiter? And the opening price for LinkedIn is £245 a month. So we're £8.99. So you just say, right, we're, you know, we're just going to make this stupidly inexpensive to get people on board. And then at some point in the future, you can say, OK, look, we can build that, but just let's get the volume into the business. My model is predicated on volume. I mean, what I want is lots of people to use it and for it to be very inexpensive for them to use. If a company does our survey, um, so Enterprise Inns, the pub group, have just paid to do our survey. Uh, they've got something like 3,000 people that work in their pubs and restaurants over the, around the country. Um, the bill to them was £15,000 to do our survey, get the data, get the feedback, etc. If they had gone to one of our competitors, the next closest, they'd have paid £30,000, um, so my game is to try at the moment to get in the volume to the site uh, and then you look at pricing in the future. Um, but there are different models. Pricing models is one of the things that keeps you awake at night and you agonise over, you know, if I got this right, if I put my price up to 30, would I have as many customers? Can I get two customers for every one they're getting and therefore, broadly speaking, have the same level of economics? So it's a tough issue. So we work with the civil service. Uh, we've just been asked to pitch for the civil service engagement survey, 455,000 people. Um, but we, we work with not-for-profit, we work with civil servants. So the model works for all of them. So you still get, are you fairly paid? Uh, are you recognised when you do something well? Are people giving you the information you need to do your job? Do you feel empowered and trusted to get on and do things? Do you feel your organisation looks after your well-being? Do you feel you do something worthwhile? So we find that NHS and teachers are off the Richter on sense of purpose. You know, we do something really worthwhile, and they do. Um, you find they score less well on pay. Um, so what they'll say is, we're trading off pay for doing something that's really worthwhile. But funny enough, you find that um, they're happier. So teachers score more highly, uh, not-for-profits score more highly than often people in the commercial world. If you uh, were to generalise madly, you find that uh, bankers and lawyers feel very well paid, but they don't feel any great sense of pride in what they're doing. 
they don't feel particularly well looked after, they don't feel particularly developed, and overall their happiness is lower. So we're currently working with two financial institutions who are saying, look, we just need our people to be more engaged and happier at work. And it isn't about the pay, it's about all the other things. You know, how do you, how do you get somebody to feel that they're doing something really worthwhile when they work in a bank? Uh, how do you get a lawyer to feel that they're doing something really worthwhile? Um, how do you get them to feel that they're developing their careers? So it's different. So we get different results for every sector. We get different results for gender, uh, management, non-management, etc. The, the, the first thing you do is just got to get in front of somebody, haven't you? So, you know, and that needs great perseverance. It's a question of when you get an opportunity saying, can I come and talk to you about? So we write lots of letters, we make lots of phone calls, uh, we send out our brochure, uh, I write articles in the newspapers. We do lots of things to try and say, look, we do this and get an invitation to come in. The thing that works every time is that when people come in, Jill, could you go back to the homepage? Um, right, if you click on start free survey, so the thing that I do, the most important thing when I'm in a, in a meeting is to um, get people to actually go and do the survey. Uh, skip. If you press skip, if you go down, just press skip. So if I can get in front of somebody and I can get to this point and I can say, right, what we're going to do now is for the next seven minutes we're going to do this survey. I'm not going to do it with you. But I get them to this page. Oh, right, you have started doing it. So we're going to do, do you feel appropriately rewarded for your work? Next question. And I actually get them to do the survey. And when they've gone through it, they get a score. So you're then personally invested. You've got a score. You've seen what it is. Then we go through to the screen that says, this is what you can do to be happier. And they do it, and they kind of get it. They go, oh, blimey, Henry, that's good. And I say, and you could do this for all your workers, and they could all be happier, and you'd get this data, and it's only going to cost you this amount of money. And at the moment, you're probably paying three times that, and you're not getting this. So I, I tried to demonstrate what we do, and the product's so good that 99% of the time they go, that's fantastic, we want to take this forward. So um, as you can tell, I don't use a personal trainer. Or if, if I do, they're not very good. Yeah, very good. <laughs> So the first thing you do is you've got to get in front of somebody and then you've got to, you've got to find a way of, of getting them to give it a go. You've got to say, look, uh, come and have a free session. Come and do this. And then when they've done it, it's, you know, I hope you enjoyed that, da di da di da So I think of demonstrating your skills, getting a way to show people what you do is the best way to get people to buy in one way or another. Have you got a website? All right, well done you. But so I think just having some basic stuff about why are you different? Why should people come to you? Why are you the best personal trainer? Uh, are, are you better because you're cheaper than everybody else? Are you better because you've got new routines that nobody else does? Uh, what is it about you? So just spending some time thinking, you know, if there are 10,000 personal trainers out there, why me? Uh, and it's perhaps because you're flexible, you've got more time, you can fit in with other people's schedules, etc., etc. So the thing that I would think about is why, you, why are you going to be different and why are you going to be better? Then trying to get yourself in front of people to, to have a conversation and then trying to demonstrate, if you can, free of charge, how they can feel so much better by working with you. So we're working on that now with Lancaster University. They want a student survey, and so yeah, you know, if they want to contact me, I'm really happy to work on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so Shakira Martin, uh, I got to know last year, and um, uh, Lancaster said they wanted to build a trial out, which then we would use everywhere. But happy to work with any academic institutions to try and do that to get people into this.